In the last video, we talked about how to get discrete random outcomes with non-uniform distributions. This time we'll make a system that lets you use an animation curve to draw a continuous distribution. That means we can generate random decimal values from any non-uniform distribution. This is going to be more mathematically involved than the last video, but I'll do my best to try and explain it in a way so you don't have to fully understand the math. You can skip straight to the programming part if you want, but I'm going to start with a really quick probability lesson. So hit the like button, make sure you're subscribed, and let's get started. A continuous distribution is one where it's possible to get any of the infinite values between the minimum and maximum. When we use random.range in Unity to get a float value, we're approximating a continuous distribution over the range we specify. I say it's an approximation because a computer can't actually represent every single value in the range, but it's close enough that we can treat it like it's a continuous distribution. When we talk about continuous distributions, one useful tool is the probability density function. As an example, let's look at the probability density function of random.range. To get an understanding of what it shows us, remember that when we call random range, there's an equal probability of getting any number within the range. The probability density function shows the random value on the x-axis and the probability of getting that value on the y-axis. So the density function for random range is going to be a horizontal line from the minimum value to the maximum value. This is just showing us that every value in the range has equal probability of occurring. And this is what I'm talking about when I say a uniform distribution. The point of this video is to be able to use non-uniform distributions, which is any distribution that isn't a horizontal line like this one. There's one important characteristic of the probability density function, and that's that the area under the curve must be equal to 1. That means if we take the integral of the density function, it would increase from 0 to 1, but wouldn't go any higher. And don't let the mention of integration scare you away. We'll see later that it's really easy to approximate the integral of an animation curve. I'm mentioning integrals because the integral of the density function is another important function when talking about continuous distributions. It's called the cumulative distribution function. And while the density function shows us the probability of getting an exact value, the cumulative distribution function will show us the probability of getting anything that's less than or equal to a value. So if we use random range from 0 to 5, we could look at the cumulative distribution function and see that the probability of getting a value of 2 or less is going to be 0.4 or 40%. The last function we need to talk about is something called the quantile function. It's not used as much as the density function or the cumulative distribution function, but we need it for the method we're going to use, which is called inverse transform sampling. We can get the quantile function by just inverting the cumulative distribution function. And inverting the function just means we swap the x and y axes. The idea behind inverse transform sampling is that if we take a bunch of random samples from the quantile function, the distribution of the samples will closely match the distribution that we started with. We can look at an example using a non-uniform distribution. So we'll say we're getting a random value between 0 and 10, but the values around 5 are much more likely. So our density function is going to be a bell curve. The integral or the cumulative distribution function will look something like this s-curve that will go from 0 to 1 on the y-axis. Then we can flip the axes of this and get the quantile function. Now we can see if we take a random point on the x-axis between 0 and 1 for this graph, the corresponding y value is very likely to be close to 5 since the curve flattens out in the middle. Similar to how we can transform a point from world space to local space of some game object, we can use inverse transform sampling to transform a uniformly distributed random value to a non-uniform space. Now we can get into writing some code. So first I'll create the script and I'll call it continuous distribution. And for now, let's get rid of the start and update methods because we aren't going to need them. And we'll create a serialized animation curve. We're going to use this animation curve to define our probability density function. And since our end goal is to get a random number, let's create a property that's going to return a random value. It'll work just like using random.value in Unity, so we can easily get a random value from our distribution. 
In order to get our random value, we need to determine the quantile function from the density function we define with the animation curve. So we can start by creating a quantile class. And the only variable we're going to need in this is an array of 2D vectors that holds all of the points in the function. Now let's make a constructor for the quantile class. We need to pass in both the density function and the resolution we want, where the resolution just defines how many line segments we use to approximate the function. Then we want to set the size of the points array to the resolution plus one, since we need one extra point for the last line segment. And since we know the function needs to start at zero, we can set the first element to vector2.0. Since we define the resolution, we know exactly how many steps it'll take to create the quantile function, but we need to know how big the steps are. We can calculate that step size by dividing the maximum value of our range by the resolution we define. Now to get the quantile function, we need to integrate and then invert the density function. So let's make a function that does that for us. We won't need to return anything since we'll just be modifying our points array, but we do need to pass in the density function and the step size that we calculated in the constructor. Now to integrate the density function, we want to loop through all the points and set the y value to the sum of the probabilities of all values less than or equal to the current x value. To do this, at each step we're going to multiply our step size by i and then evaluate the density function at this point. This tells us the probability of getting the value x from the distribution, and for now we can store that value in a temporary variable so we can modify it later. Since we want to invert the integral anyways, we're going to store the y value in the x component of our vector and the x value in the y component. This basically inverts the function while we're integrating it. We also need to make sure that there's no negative probabilities, so we'll use mathf.max to set the negative probabilities to zero. I should point out that usually when you're approximating an integral, you would multiply by the step size, but since we're normalizing the function anyways, it's not necessary in this case. The next step is where the actual integration comes in. We'll add the previous value of the integrated function to our current sample, which accumulates all of the previous probabilities. When the integration and inversion is done, we need to make sure that the maximum value on the x-axis is 1, so we're going to take the current maximum and use it as a normalization factor for the rest of the values in the points array. With the x-axis normalized, we have an approximation of the quantile function, and all we need now is to sample it. So let's create a sample function that returns a float. And the first thing we'll do is get a random value between 0 and 1. Since we normalized the x-axis of the quantile function, we know that 0 to 1 will cover the entire range. Since our function is defined as an array, we won't have a point for every possible random value. So we're going to need to determine what points in the array the value falls between. We can do this by looping through our points array until we get to a point with an x value that's greater than the random value. Once that's true, we know that the random value is between the x component of the previous point and the x component of the current point. And since we can't guarantee that it's always going to be directly on a point, we need to interpolate between the two. To do that, we need to figure out where the value is between the two points. So we can subtract the lower point from our random value, and then divide that by the distance between the two points. Now we can pass that and the y component of both points into the lerp function and return the result. The last thing to do is to go back to our distribution class and add a quantile variable. Then we'll create a new quantile in the awake method, and for our random value we'll return quantile.sample. Now, whenever we call distribution.randomValue, we're going to get a random value from that distribution. We can look at our example of a bell curve from 0 to 10, and we'll see that when we get a random value, it's much more likely to be around 5 than at either of the extremes. With that, you should have more than enough control over random numbers in your game, so hit the like button, make sure you're subscribed, and I'll see you next time.